Good afternoon. Well, Ali has just given us um, an overview of what we know empirically about the effects of, of vertical constraints. And, and uh, I think I could sort of interpret it as saying we, we actually don't know that much. Right? Uh, there's, there are some studies, but not that much. And even if we get f further to the specificities of, of uh, online restraints, uh, uh, then perhaps we know even less, although he thinks it's, they should be that different. But the fact that we don't know uh, that we're sort of in a new world, I think that can also be reflected in what you see in competition or authorities. The activities have there's been a huge uh, revival of interest in vertical restraints. And um, if you look like for, from my point of view in the in European Commission, we've actually not really done any cases over the last 10 years since we got rid of the uh, notification system. We've Almost nothing has happened. And there are two reasons for that. Uh, I think one is that a lot of um, distribution agreements were actually, actually uh, more national than European. So a lot of cases that, that, that were there were dealt with by national competition authorities. And um, second, and I guess related to the first, uh, that a lot of the issues seem to be fairly settled. So although one might not agree with what the law said. I think there was not that much uh, disagreement about what it actually said. So there was no reason for, I say, the Commission to try to get in and try to, to try to create a consensus at the European level because it was not that things were really going in different directions. And I'm not sure these Re both of these two reasons actually apply uh, to the online world, or at least they don't apply to the, to the same degree as it did to a brick and mortar world. One could say that perhaps the internet is, if not changing, then at least sort of challenging the sort of national market of, uh, of distribution that we had before. It's become much more easier to, cross, to shop uh, cross border. And the online world is, is certainly asking some, some questions that are not been, been asked or, and therefore not also answered, answered previously. And we are seeing some of these issues now being treated to some degree differently in member states. Uh, we're hearing people saying that the world has changed so much since in the only five years since the Commission revised its, uh, its rules on vertical restraints that saying people are saying it's, it's outdated, some people are saying it's simply wrong. And uh, that we should rethink. There are arguments about that free riding is much more easy now, that therefore we have to rethink about whether there's a more, we should listen more to, to efficiency arguments for, for restraining, uh, for, uh, for, for certain uh, vertical practices. We're seeing a thing like online platforms where people are saying, yes, some of what you said five years ago, maybe that was okay because then they were more like flea markets, but now they are really like proper markets and therefore we should look differently at, and the rules should not be as, as they are. Uh, so all this means that, that vertical restraints have suddenly become uh, sexy again, right? So not only at uh, the national level, but also at the European Commission, uh, the European level. And there are a lot of things going on. So what I'd like to do is to try to bring you up to speed a bit what's going on um, at the European level related to this topic. And this is why you see this rather grandiose title there, because I'm not restricting myself to, to, to antitrust. I'll also try to get a little bit of a broader policy picture of what's going on. Then I'll talk a bit um, about the uh, sector inquiry into e-commerce that we launched, and, uh, and then very briefly just run over the, uh, quickly some of the cases that we have uh, had. Some of them are ongoing, some recent related to the internet as a distribution channel. But f I have to point to the disclaimer at the bottom here, um, else I can get into trouble. So first I'd like to, to talk about uh, just a few minutes on the broader picture. Uh, so we're focusing on antitrust, but there is really a wider debate going on in, in Europe. And it is not completely unimaginable that uh, as a result of this debate, we'll get uh, le uh, legislation, which means that some of the things we think are interesting and talking about now in the antitrust world will simply be taken completely out of the antitrust world because they will be legislated away. Right? And uh, since I guess many of you are not following in details what's sort of happening inside the Brussels Beltway, I will give you a brief introduction to this. So we uh, got a new commission uh, last November with the Chung 
Claude Juncker as the president, and he very briefly, or very quickly set out 10 uh, priorities, where one of them was a digital single market. And there's a quote there, uh, which I'll leave you to read if you want, but uh, it could, uh, the important words are the existing barriers online. And this is sort of a red thread uh, to, through what I will talk about. Um, and you will see that these existing uh, barriers is something that people are very serious about attacking. And on the same web page, you can see there are these three policy areas or pillars, better online access, uh, an environment where digital networks and services can prosper, digital as a driver for growth. And under each of these, there are actions, and there are actually concrete timelines for some of these actions. Some of these are sort of very you see, mundane and have not, not that much to do with us, like uh, improving postal services, delivery service across border, and, so, and things like that. And there's, there's uh, something more ambitious, perhaps uh, copyright um, regime, sort of trying to go over that and see if it can be simplified to make sales across borders um, easier. Um, there's something about trying to simplify VAT rules, cross-border sales. So a lot of things that are not that much to what, what, uh, to what we're talking about here, but also something that, that is a bit closer to what it is. One is, is called tackling geo-blocking. And it talks about the practice in very uh, negative terms. So geo-blocking is where you can buy in, this, in another member state, uh, perhaps, or, or if you are simply sent back, you try to get a better price cross a border and you're sent back to, and have to pay a higher price because where you are. And that is something politicians do not like at all, right? And there are a lot of people saying something very negative about that. Uh, some of our, one of our vice presidents come out very strongly and there will be apparently a legislative proposal already in early 2016 dealing with unjustified geo-blocking, where, of course, a lot of economists are saying, well, that sounds like price discrimination. We don't really know whether it's good or bad. We have to think more about that. I think that is just a train that may be going like this. Right? So although uh, this is something, or at least there's a risk that it would be like, uh, that it could be like that. And another thing is, uh, another of the actions is the role of online platforms. And there, the language is a little bit more careful. So I'm not so sure that, uh, I, I understood my own commissioner was out saying, maybe we should take it easy. But there are politicians in various, not only at the MEPs, but also national politicians who are very strongly talking about going in and regulating platforms. So I'm just saying this to say we, that some of, some of the things we're talking about may be irrelevant from an antitrust point of view in a couple of years' time. Um, so let me get uh, now a bit closer to home, and uh, at least to my home, which is the DG competition. Uh, so let me talk to you a little bit about the uh, e-sector inquiry, uh, which was initiated uh, on the 6th of May this year, and that was no coincidence, also the same day as the Commission published its strategy for the digital single market. And uh, so what is a sector inquiry? Well, there's something here which is uh, where it gives a legal basis for doing it, and it, but it is an inquiry into a particular sector of the economy or into a particular type of agreements across various sectors. But it is something that's quite important is, is a competition policy tool, Article 17 is Oh, sorry, uh, Regulation 1 is a regulation that rules how we implement Article 101 and Article 2, so it's really a competition tool. This means that this is something that is done for competition policy purposes, not just to feed data into the digital single uh, market. Of course, we think that we will write a report, and maybe that report can try to balance or have it be an input in the debate uh, also whether there is a necessity to legislate, etc., maybe we can influence that debate by what we're doing here. Uh, one, but, but uh, another thing to know is that this is not something that in itself can lead to an infringement of competition law. So if we want to do cases, we have to do cases afterwards. There's also, for those of you who know about the, the, the UK regime, there's a difference in that we cannot, um, uh, we have to, Afterwards, to find breach of competition law is related to competition law, while the UK market invest investigation, as I understand it, they do not have to find prop directly problems of infringement of competition law. They can still intervene because there are problems in the market. They also have remedies going in, and they can actually make structural remedies, so uh, separate companies, 
on the basis of these sectoral inquiries, we have to go and do cases afterwards and afterwards uh, argue why remedies are on the basis of that is, is necessary. So just very briefly tell you what, what this sector inquiries is actually. It was something that came in, we had a proper possibility in 2004, uh, we got it. And then it seemed that we were very eager in the beginning and then sort of was not so eager, right? So it's like seven years since we did the last one. It's been, we had three before. Two of these, uh, the energy and the pharmaceutical case, uh, pharmaceutical sector inquiry actually led to a stream of cases afterwards, while the one in financial services did not. So it does, there's no necessity that we will lead, it will lead to cases, but it can happen. So what are the goals? Uh, very high level, to just, uh, well, we want to get a, a better understanding of what's, what's going on, uh, but it's particularly cross-border e-commerce, just as this digital single market is a lot about cross-border. This sector inquiry is a lot about are there, uh, are there difficulties uh, to cross-border created by private companies, while the broader digital single market is a lot about are there rules that can be, governmental rules that can be changed. Here it's about are there are companies creating difficulties to cross-border trade. If necessary, afterwards, provide guidance to business. That means uh, doing cases, right? And telling them what they can do and not do. So if necessary, we will do cases afterwards. We may also go back and change the legal framework, uh, uh, which I'll explain in a second very briefly. And then, of course, it may go, something may feed into the digital single market, uh, the wider policy debate. So what is a legal framework? and uh, Particularly here, and this may surprise those of you who don't know that much about it, um, if what happens in Europe. So we have something called vertical block regulation, and uh, Article 4 talks about something called hardcore restrictions, which means that it's something that's presumed to be uh, illegal. Uh, restrictions of the territory customer group is uh, can be illegal and restriction what's called active, active and passive sales to end users by members of a selective distribution system can be illegal or is considered hardcore. And what does this mean? Well, this distinction between active and passive sales means that basically, well, uh, the idea was if you are a seller and you are, and, uh, and you are um, uh, going actively into an area where you are not supposed to be in a selective distribution system, then you are, you, that you are not allowed to do. But if a customer comes from that area to you, then that's passive sale and then you should be able to sell to him. And then the, the crucial thing here is that having an internet site, a website is considered passive sale. So that means that you are allowed to sell via the internet to customers coming from other countries. And this is, of course, where, where the problems come, that a lot of companies are basically putting in restrictions or telling the retailers, well, try not to sell, uh, or, or maybe whispering to them, try not to sell to customers in other countries, and that makes it life becomes uh, difficult if you're trying to do cross-border uh, sales. So this is a lot what we are focusing about in the, uh, in the uh, sector inquiry, whether there are these kind of restrictions in reality. So why do we think there may be some problems? Uh, we have uh, some evidence from our own casework. We have NCAs, we have cases. And there are policy initiatives where people are, are talking about this. Um, and so this cross-border is, as I said, the focus of the, of the uh, sector inquiry. There are some studies there, and I'm not sure these would uh, pass uh, Ali's, the methodologies used would pass the exams in Ali's course in, in Chicago, but still uh, it gives some evidence here that uh, companies that have been, uh, there have been surveys where uh, people are saying that they are forbidding being uh, told not to sell abroad. Uh, there's some estimates how much it will increase. I don't know how much we should put to that. But there are consumers who are saying, saying that they were redirected. Uh, there are consumers saying that they were simply refused access by foreign sellers. So we have some, some information that uh, seems to say there is a problem. So what will we do? Uh, so again, repeating myself, but it's really a cross-border e-commerce we are focusing on. We are looking at lots of sectors. Um, 
various sectors. There's both goods and there's also problems with digital content, the fact that you cannot uh, buy films abroad, and, uh, watch television, buy uh, uh, because of copyright perhaps or other, other reasons. Uh, we will cooperate with national competition authorities and what we'll do is we're sending out lots of requests for information. So basically this is uh, um, electronic uh, questionnaires where people go to our website and then they, they fill them out. I think we are contacting, uh, I've heard numbers around 2,000 companies have been contacted. Uh, and we started this Monday actually, the first wave went, went out. Uh, and um, and they will keep going out now before the summer. Then the timing is uh, that already next year um, we, will, we should have a pri uh, first report out of a draft or a preliminary report. And then there will be a public consultation and there will be a final report in the first quarter of 2017, which is actually fairly tight, but it, this is there's so much political pressure from these other things, this wider thing going on, that we have to do it perhaps quicker than we, we would have liked to. Let me then just finally say something about what's going on with cases. And uh, first, a couple of, of cases um, that we have finished. Uh, we had also an e-book case, uh, similar to the, the case that uh, Ali just talked about, and we were coordinating and talking a lot with the, with the DOJ um, while, we were, while we were doing it. So um, we got remedies, we finished, we didn't go, have to go to court, we got remedies by both Apple and uh, all the publishers, first four of them in, in late 2012 and then the fifth one came on board in 2017. And I would just like to say one thing to, to what Ali said. I, I think this case was not really about vertical restraints, MFNs as such. It was not how we, we saw it. Uh, we, we thought that the, the MFNs that I, Apple and the publisher signed were basically a tool to force Apple, uh, to force Amazon to switch to the agency model. So we took no positions on whether MFNs in themselves uh, were okay or, or not okay, and I think if Apple had come individually and signed the same MFN contract with one publisher, probably nobody would have had any problems with it. But it was the fact that they was basically they were coordinating on this, and it was clear what the what the purpose was. It was to force Amazon to also to go on the agency and to get the prices up. So it was really the horizontal aspects that I think was the the uh, determining force, not not the fact that they were MFNs as such. Uh, then we also, there's been an e-hotel bookings case in, in Europe, similar to what uh, I think Ali was talking about. And here it ended up uh, a bit uh, differently. There's been various cases also before that, both in the UK and in, and in Germany. And then there were these, uh, this case that the commission was involved in. It was not a commission case, it was free um, national competition authorities in Italian was one of them and the commission was sort of involved in a bit of a coordinating, not deciding what to do, but sort of facilitating role in order to get the coordination going is the right way to say it. And here in the end, as I understand it, there was, uh, if we again talk about the vertical restraints, there was two different M MFNs that people talk about, narrow MFN and a wide MFN. And basically the idea in the end, as I understand the, the remedies, uh, the idea was that, well, it is sort of okay for the platforms to say that the hotel should not be able to put lower prices on their own websites than they put on the platforms, because that seemed could lead to a lot of free riding going on, but they should not, on the other hand, the plan, there should not be MFNs across the different platforms, so that one platform should not be able to say, well, we want to make sure that the lowest price uh, is always here and there cannot be a lower price posted on another platform. So really the difference between these two different things where I think there was a lot of, of, uh, of acceptance of that it seemed wrong that hotels, well there was a lot of push from hotels actually, they wanted to be able to put a certain price on the, on the website, on the, on the platforms and then themselves have a lower price. And I mean I know I already myself call 
and ask, even though I know that they, they shouldn't do it, I still call and ask whether they want to give me a lower price because I know they can save 30%. So if I knew that, that they can actually now freely have it there, I'm going to go every time and call the, call the hotel, right? So I had a lot of personal sympathy for the free riding argument that because I knew I would do it to myself. Um, but one argument which came up, which is an, sort of an interesting one, and it, and it also can, comes up in the next case, which is about um, Amazon uh, MFNs was the sort of efficiency of having that consumers don't have to go more than one place. And this is an argument that some of these platforms are making, and I think Amazon is making it. We have a, just opened two weeks ago a case on Amazon. Amazon has a whole array of MFN clauses, which covers uh, both some pricing, but also business models. And basically, I, as I understand it, Amazon's idea is basically the consumers should know that it doesn't make sense going anywhere else because we will have everything and we will have the lowest price. And of course you can say That's, that sounds efficient, right? We all just go to Amazon and uh, then we don't need to try and look at somebody, somebody else's platform because we'll never ever find anything better on another platform. But of course it sounds a little, also as an efficiency was a little bit hard to accept at least as prima facie as a competition authority than just say we just go to one but some of these platforms may have, and I think booking is a little bit, was a bit the same idea. They, they would have liked to make sure that they could tell their customers, you don't have to go anywhere else. We have every hotel room that is ever, you can find any platform at the best price. So don't bother going to somewhere else. Right? But uh, it's a little, I'm a little bit uncomfortable about accepting that immediately at least. But we will have to look into this now because I'm sure that I think they will make this argument. Uh, and as I said, we just opened it two, two weeks ago, so we will have now to, which means that we sort of get into a more formal phase, and we'll see how it ends up. Then we have a case, uh, we have a case which is about TV, uh, pay TV con uh, content, which is basically about that um, some studios, US studios, insist in their, uh, in their, uh, uh, agreements with pay TV companies in, in Europe that they make sure that nobody from another country basically can uh, can get a subscription and can buy um, uh, on their platforms uh, and this is something which means that basically border cross-border uh, access is blocked completely and then we have something called online electronics retailers which I cannot say that much about you will not find anything on any any uh, uh, on any uh, on our website, but we have rated twice over the last uh, the first in December 2013 and second in two, March 2015 uh, online on electronics companies to see all, again whether there's some blocking of uh, uh, cross border sales basically and also some yeah, RPM issues. Then I've mentioned Google Search and Google Android. They're not really related, but of course in a broader sense they are somehow related to, uh, they're not related to directly to the vertical restraints I've been talking about here, we are talking about here, but of course in a broader sense they are related to it. So my time is out, I hope I've shown you there are lots of things going on at the European Commission level related to this topic. I'm sure some of you will think there's too much going on at the European level for the, for the moment, but at least you cannot excuse of, uh, excuse of uh, ignoring the top topic, so thank you.